Bonjour et bienvenue à la, The Last Taco. <rire> Bonne semaine pour la Française dans la rugby à tres. Apparently that means it was a good week for Rugby League in France, which we'll discuss on The Last Tackle. Uh, joining me in the studio, uh, Rugby League Hall of Famer and Heritage number at Leeds 1184, Gary Schofield. And, I haven't got a number yet, we'll find one for him, uh, Phil Kaplan. <laughs> well. Six and three quarters. 4020, I guess, is the, uh, the right number uh, for uh, him. Uh, at RL on our wise, the place to uh, get in touch with us uh, throughout the week with your thoughts on the uh, world of uh, rugby league and I guess we start well we have to start with the, the big shock of the weekend which is not uh, jokingly Leeds and Huddersfield both winging on Friday which we'll come to in a moment but the Challenge Cup has been uh, set alight in round five by the uh, victory for the Oldham Roughheads away at Hull Kingston Rovers and uh, Chairman Neil Hudgel saying after the game in a statement on Twitter uh, calling out some uh, dishonesty within the, uh, the club so Gary, the floor is yours. Hawkins and Rovers versus Oldham. I guess, first of all, we should say Oldham, having come up from League One last year, beating a Super League team quite comprehensively. Congratulations to them. Yeah, many congratulations to Oldham. Uh, one thing what they did, the, um, I think the players certainly respect the Challenge Cup, the Oldham players, and they went with the right attitude. So a couple of things here, Rich, quite honestly. I'm delighted what Mr Hunchler says about them players. Also, I'm delighted uh, James Webster with his comments as well, what he has said about them players, because unfortunately for James, you know, he got cheated on by the way through players last year. We all know the comments, what he said, and the players walked all over him. Mm. So quite simply, what James Webster should have done last year at Wayfield, he should not have defended the players like he did. And I'm delighted, absolutely delighted that James Webster has said, you know, I'm not taking responsibility for the players have to do that. Then players on Saturday, and I've spoken to a few Hulkers and Rover supporters and, uh, you know, and a few of their sponsors, and then players should hold their heads in shame. Absolutely disgusting and disrespectful. I mean, not just to the Challenge Cup, but also to the supporters, the chairman and the coach. And what I have been told, you know, the players were in yesterday morning at 7 o'clock. Do you know what? I bet they couldn't care less that they were in at 7 o'clock yesterday morning. They all just think, well, it's just another training session, we've lost a game, and then we'll try and put it out next week. But then players should hold their heads in shame. Absolutely disrespectful to Hulkies and others as a club. I think the most amazing thing about the whole episode is the word that Neil Hodgill chose to use. Bearing in mind that he's a solicitor and he knows the implications mm. of using a word like dishonesty. Now, I'm assuming that obviously that isn't aimed at the backroom staff, which is new. And Jamie Peacock will, will be hurting as much as anybody. Um, that would go against all the principles he's trying to build into the club. James Webster, we know, is an honourable man. Um, he's been given a job and two weeks ago we were lauded him for the job that he was doing. Magnificent mm -hmm. result at Headingley. Um, so who is that dishonesty aimed at? Uh, you can only assume it's some players within the club. Um, and I would imagine that although there is going to be a, um, a public forum to discuss it, when certain players move on we'll realise who they were. Um, I wouldn't even begin to hazard a guess. But the fact that that word has been used mm -hmm. Is, is as, well, probably as detrimental as you can get. But I think we should also, as, as you briefly mentioned, um, Oldham coach by Scott Naylor, somebody who, again, has come through that Bradford school, um, great respect for, uh, for, the, for the competition. And also Chris Hamilton, chairman of Oldham, has worked on absolutely threadbare resources for, well, close on 20 years since they were relegated from, from Super League, went into liquidation, had to reform and start again. So it, this is a massive achievement for Oldham. Um, and again, I think the magnitude of the score as well. It wasn't that they nicked it in the last mm. minute with a controversial yeah. penalty. They were rare, rarely, if ever, troubled. <laughs> but also, yeah, but, uh, and I say, it's great testament to what Oldham did, Phil, but this should not happen, should it? This sh if this was in football, the FA Cup, this it is like... It shouldn't. This is like... Isn't it great this is like in, in some oh, ways, isn't it great? It has, hasn't it put some magic but, back but into the say, cup? If this were happening in football, it's like Stephen is beating Manchester United. Yeah. You know, this should not happen. And at the end of the day, it's all down to the attitude of them players and by all accounts two players were okay in in Blair and I think Sean Long got the man and, of the match and in the, but, but in the, the rest of them but the big thing about it for these players right they can't get dropped they can't well, get that's dropped. the other problem they, ca they can't get dropped there's no A team all them players except Lunt and Blair who mm -hmm. played okay by all accounts should keep the place the rest of them they should be dropped 
but they can't be because there's no A team. Well, and also, all be, all be dropped, bring the young kids in and let, let players play who want to play with pride, put that shirt on and say, listen, I want that jersey because I want to play for and the there's a, there's a couple of young kids in the team that are obviously investing their future. Yeah, that they've they've given up upgraded yeah. contracts. Yeah. Well, well, I tell you, well, why, don't, why don't we play them this week? But the, I guess this is the issue. Who is, who is fit and able to come into the squad? You know, they're missing Campesi and Kelly, who are the key drivers. Mm. Um, which was going to take a toll. Again, I'm, I'm going to mention the Easter period because, yeah. again, there, there seems to be a hangover in a number of games. This is a point I'm making for the coach. His hands seem tied because he Do can't you, drop them and they're all, they're all in the comfort zone. But I say what Mr Hutchill has said, I hope he's true to his word, smokes out whoever are the bad apples because quite clearly there's more than one. There's more than one bad apple in yeah. there. So as soon as he does that, because look at the Rovers, you know, the, uh, the way that Mr Hutchill sees it, OK, at times he might think they're a little bit bigger and better than what the club is. But I tell you what, they are a fair, honest, hard-working club and the supporters yeah, deserve absolutely. far better do you, what do you the th- players are Do you think it on. was down purely to complacency? That they looked at the fixture and thought, oh, yeah, we've had we that. went to Wembley last yeah. year, we can beat this lot. But that, but that and, and, it, and you can't turn that round once that momentum well, has gone away from you. The players should have that in the first place. I, 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 just a thing here: when Workington came, it was back in 1994. Workington thought they could beat us. All we needed was quite simply was Workington. We just got to turn up and turn mm-hmm. us over. Mm-hmm. That was just motivation. I'm sure Aldo had the same sort of attitude. So all you do, that attitude is right. Okay, then we're going to blow this uh, this team off the park by half time and make the job easy for ourselves. Hulking some Rovers. Quite clearly, this is a player's fault. It's the players' fault. It's not the chairman. It's not the coach. It's do not the support. Do you have to it's look the at the people who have recruited these players. Maybe so. Because Maybe again, so. the the pendulum then starts to swing back to the person doing the accusation. So, <sighs> it's a very difficult situation because they can't change it in the short term. Well, absolutely disgraceful. The Mulcaster Rovers players. players. That said, great boost for the Challenge Cup. Oh, we, well, we absolutely. Had, we had Lee last year. Yeah. Um, who got to the quarterfinals, and we were all going, oh, maybe there is still life in the in the in the old girl yet. We had Castleford getting to Wembley in 2014. Hull KR last year again, different teams at the national stadium, which is what we want. And we will, I know, get on to talk about French rugby league. But the other result that was a a, a real shot in the arm, and almost as big a surprise, was uh, Toulouse, who were playing in League One, mm-hmm. beating Lee who, although they had one or two players missing, had a very strong team out there in, in the south of France. And again, great for the competition to have also, two French teams in the and last also, 16. Let's not forget Batley. Great to victory mm-hmm. against Feversley. You know, plenty of people would have, would have had That was a great game. Feversley, well, yeah. a really enjoyable the, the, game. The Challenge Cup, you know, it brought all the history back and you know that where the underdog uh, can sometimes turn over the big boys. But one thing for sure, Oldham should not turn over Oakley's and Rovers. And you players, take a long, hard look at yourself because you were disgraced at the weekend. And I guess he mentioned that Batley versus Featherson game where a sign once again that it's a shame, perhaps a disgrace, that uh, there isn't more championship rugby on television, especially when, you know, I could watch, I've watched for the last couple of weeks, second tier rugby union teams on my telly and it's not quite as entertaining. I guess the argument for that is there is obviously a cost implication to transmit a game. And the broadcaster has to decide if enough people are going to tune in to justify that outlay. And I think the calculation state, possibly not. But that isn't to say we couldn't put a package together of championship rugby mm-hmm. and sell that to perhaps a broadcaster that isn't covering rugby league at the moment. That would be fabulous. But again, we, we were fortunate enough to watch all of that game. Um, I thought Mount Pleasant looked fantastic in, it the, in the sun. I thought uh, the tra- two traditional kits as well, which, which came over really well. Great atmosphere at the ground. Uh, and some, some terrific rugby played. Certainly uh, James Brown, the Batley hooker, is, uh, is making a name for himself. And I think, again, Keegan Hurst, we mentioned him a few weeks ago. He's, he's still leading the line magnificently. And, and I, I just thought it was, it was a great cup occasion. And by John Keir, who obviously is a great respecter of the cup. And what would we give for Wakefield against Batley in the next round? Well, I mean, John I playing himself. I don't want to... Uh, <laughs> I'd be quite happy with that draw, but uh, never mind. Uh, elsewhere, wins for, as you'd expect, so uh, wait for your witness, uh, Salford uh, over uh, lower league opposition. Dewsby as well, who had a scare against the York City Knights in Halifax, uh, ending the uh, road uh, for Lock Lane. But you mentioned it there as well, Toulouse mm-hmm. with that win over Lee. Um, I guess going into Thursday's draw, which... Should be an interesting occasion. Martin Afire and uh, John Humphrey is doing Fantastic. well on the... Uh, Three on million the, people who are program. listening to rugby league for the first time, possibly. Uh, Gary obviously didn't get the call. He was obviously away in Ireland when they uh, 
when uh, the Today programme called, sadly, but uh, at least we know that uh, as opposed to a previous time when uh, BBC Radio has done the uh, draw nationally, that it will be treated with respect and reverence. I, I think, again, the word coming back from the BBC is that having somebody like Jamie Jones Buchanan um, on Radio 4 previewing things like the World Club Challenge, they, they suddenly realise that you know, we do have personalities that stand alongside any of the other sporting ones. There's a lot of good reaction to, to what he said and the way he said it and the passion and enthusiasm and, and obviously we know him well enough to, to see why that would rub off and to now get the draw on a national stage, it, um, even though it's a couple of days later than it normally would be, I think is, is, is a great coup for the Rugby League and deserve credit for that. I've enjoyed people that claim because he's not on TV, there'll be uh, plenty of uh, hot and cold points <laughs> to be selected. So uh, look forward to conspiracy theories no, no, about no, Rich. No, 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 me. No, no, this, no, this is no. the, the, the people. <laughs> look forward to all those uh, uh, conspiracy theories on social media. About uh, 20 to 9 on Thursday morning, of course, we'll bring you uh, news from the draw and uh, what we make of that uh, next week. Uh, but an exciting fifth round of the Challenge Cup. We'll, we'll stick with uh, France, obviously, to lose with that great result. Overly, and a very good result for the Catalan Dragons away at St Helens on uh, Thursday night, second in the table after the weekend's events. And I know we, we keep changing our minds perhaps, but uh, we are at the midway point before the split, and with those five away wins in a row, they're looking quite good, the Catalans. I think, I think there's a wider issue. We, we should talk about Catalan, and, and maybe um, Gary's mentioned before about potential Man of Steel candidates. I think Glenn Stewart's right up there mm. at the moment, possibly even edging Dave Taylor. But what I would say is, are we now starting to see the fruits of investment in France? Mm. Uh, it took New Zealand Warriors to be in the NRL for 10 years before we started to see New Zealand as a force emerge. And that wasn't just the Warriors themselves, that was other New Zealand players going into the competition. We've now got Catalan Dragons joint top of the Super League. We've got the Catalan Dragons reserve side won the Lord Derby Cup for the first time in the Super League era uh, on Sunday. That included six um, French international players, which included Morgan Escaré, Farhoud Yaha, Antonio Maria uh, was man of the match. Uh, we also have the Catalan under-19s that are joint top of the Reserve League. Uh, we've got people like Mikael Simon being offered a new contract at Wakefield. Are we now in a point of saying that the investment that's been made in French Rugby League in the summer era over the last 10 years is starting to bear fruit with the, with the Dragons being at the top of Super League and hopefully more French players being blended? I hope so. I, I, it could be a seminal weekend. I thought they were brilliant against St Helens. Absolutely superb. Yeah, <coughs> you look at it with, from that France point of view, Phil, but that'll only tell you know, on the international stage, won't it? You know, <coughs> if, if France playing in the game well, in Australia, we'll, we'll see from there. But just hitting on, on, on with Carlin, you just mentioned one player there in Glenn Stewart. I think he's been absolutely outstanding. But I'll tell you what, I think the, uh, the big thing for the Catalans, a big turning point, has been... We got beat by Wigan in the first game of the season. Then we all filth, know, filthy conditions, but correct. they defended yeah, well. They defended okay and just got beat. And then yeah. that horrible performance uh, against yeah. all the week after. And then obviously critics and pundits like ourselves are wanting to say, "Well, here we go again. They're here on the holidays. These so-called superstars that take it seriously." So I think that was a, a bit of a wake-up call for, for the Dragons, saying, "Hey, listen, you know what we've got to get? Not just the quality we've got to produce, but being consistent." Yeah, that's what. It, because at this moment in time, what Super League is, it's crazy at the moment. Nobody's nobody's being consistent. But what the Catalans have done since the, the uh, first two games after the two defeats, he's got the heads right. We're going to be consistent, and I'll tell you what, they are playing some smart. I, th I think again, we, well. we need to pay credit to Bernard Guache who didn't mm. panic. You know, there were a lot of people saying, as Lauren Fraser knew, had his yeah. opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think we also need to pay credit to Richie Myler, who I know that you've kept an eye on. Yeah. Well, you, uh, and well, he's, he's now yeah. almost putting himself into potential England. I'll tell you what, mate, you, you wouldn't rule it out, but what I'd say about Richie Myler quite clearly is he's not an organised halfback. No. And what we've seen at the best of Richie Myler, which he's never ever been in doubt, is his support player. Yes. So what he's doing is finally, you know, he's taking a few games, but he's reading who he should be supporting. So he'll never be the creative halfback what we're looking for. But he's got but, Todd Carney. But, well, exactly. But as a support player, you know, he, he's up there. Yeah, with, yeah. with Brealey as the best supporting halfback we've got in Super League. And he's enjoying himself. You can mm. tell that he's enjoying this new environment. I think, again, Tony Gigo is another one who yeah. I would pick out this year. We all thought, well, you know, Escaré made such an impact, then had probably a, a bit of second season syndrome, but was going to be the, the starting fullback. He's gone with Gigo, he's looked very good. Um, I still think there's a slight lack of pace, and then you look at Jody Broughton gets four tries. Mm. Uh, if they can get the ball to him, they've got an out-and-out -out finisher. So maybe it's just the balance of the team has, has come right. They've found the right selection. 
Um, they've got some real power coming off the bench. Mm. They still have a tendency occasionally in games to think, oh, we've done enough. Well, we'll come off the accelerator for five or ten minutes. That might cost them in a, in a big game. But I, I, I love the way they're playing at the moment. It must be a, a big boost to them, obviously, the fact that uh, in recent years we've criticised their away from, but to go to a way to places such as St Helens, mm. who I know they're up and down this season, but to go there and you look quite comfortable, that's uh, got to be a big boost for them. And, and certainly, at the moment, with Warrington's was and Wigan you know, wobbling here and there, Catalan's the best the, in the competition. Yeah, the next two games at home and they start again on Saturday against Salford, so they're, they're still going to be the top of the league, I would but say. That's a, but that's a big game for them, I think, because last year, if we, uh, that was the 40-all draw. And again, it's a game that Castellan will now be expected to win. Mm. Uh, so it's all very well, you know, winning away at St Helens and taking the plaudits. They've got to now back that up if we're going to take them seriously. They can't afford to be in any way complacent. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't think. I don't think I don't, they will. Yeah, exactly. I don't think. I don't think they'll be any more complacent. Yeah, I don't think they'll be more, any more complacent. Phil, to be honest with you, and uh, they're looking really impressive. And again, are we going to change his mind? Who's going to be in the grand final? Who's going to be in the top of the league? Well, now if it, oh, we're all saying Catalan. I'd be, I'd be checking the uh, the flight charters from uh, <laughs> from all the airports in the south of France because. Uh, there's a chance they could get there. They're They've impressive. got a great balance they team. Are, they are impressive. They could get there. Let's Although, see. I'll, you worry about St Helens, I would say, on the basis yeah. of that performance. Indeed. Uh, down to uh, fifth in the uh, table. I can do the maths quickly. Now, let's hear from the uh, Catalan's coach now, uh, Laurence Resnou, speaking to the last tackle. Yeah, very good, especially, especially in defence. Uh, we build uh, our performance with our defence and uh, that's pleasing because everybody knows that... Uh, at the end of the season, that will be the, the defence, will be the key. And that's only three tries you've conceded in three games now. How pleased have you been with the defence? Is it more pleasing than the attack? Yes, definitely. You know, in the past, uh, Catalan Dragon has been recognised as an offensive team, and uh, now, since the last few weeks, can be recognised as a tough defensive team. So, um, I will never be worried with the, the quality of my side to score tries. Uh, it's very good. Very good players. Uh, we need to keep on building with our with our defense because it, that's a key for me. And on that, how big was the Passieri tackle with the game still on the line, right? Yes, to to Theo. Yeah, that was again. That shows. That's an image of uh, our team at the moment. We want to turn up for for um, our friend, our mate. Um, every single. Every single time we have to do it. So uh, yeah, so it's a very good image of the of the game and and, and the way we, we want to defend. You obviously signed some high-profile players this year, but Jordi Brown probably wasn't one of those. How good has he been for you this year? No, he's not. He's not a kangaroo. He <laughs> didn't play in NRL, and uh, yeah, Jordi has been terrific. Uh, and credit to him, he, he worked hard every every day at training, and he wants to improve and wants to learn and and share with his teammates and the coaching staff and. Uh, and uh, at the moment there is a, a good result from his performance on the field so with the hard work you've got a, you've got a result so yeah, I'm really pleased for, for Julie. You obviously got called the Catalans kangaroos at one point earlier this year you had eight French guys out there tonight do you think it's unfair when people say you're just a team full of Australians? Definitely it's unfair you know after round two we had the same team and uh, we've been hammered by uh, Hull FC at home and uh, it was the same kangaroo. Uh, now, uh, what I can say is, Thomas Bosk and Alris da Costa they play hooker. They're not, they're not uh, um, used to play hooker. Or Alris a bit more, but he's, he's only 18. Good guys like Greg Muniz, Remy Casti, Tony Gigo has been excellent at fullback. Uh, but guys still uh, on the sideline like um, Morgan Escaré. Vincent Duport has been outstanding tonight. And uh, so we only talk about the kangaroos, but I can tell you the, the French guys, they are, they are part of this, this team, definitely. Laurent Fresenu there speaking after their victory over St Helens, who are sixth in the table, not fifth, as I uh, can't actually read a league table, it seems. Uh, St Helens then, um, this seems to be another uh, weekly conundrum. Uh, I've decided that they're just a mediocre team, they're neither good yeah. nor bad, uh, they're like a curate egg, I guess, but... I guess these are difficult times because you know they had great success ten years ago, but it's been a while since a, a big trophy. Was Rich, you know what? I can't, I can't argue with that, and I can't, make, I can't make a case for them. I think they're boring. I think they're poor. And then Luke Walsh, when I was watching him play the other night, 
I just don't think he's enjoying himself in that sense, Alan. Sure, I think there's too much pressure on him. And he's getting quite a bit of criticism, not just from, from pundits around the game who are watching play, but also too from the St. Helens supporters. He's not enjoying being at St. Helens as far as I'm concerned. And uh, if you look at the times when, you know, I think they, you know, they had four or five, maybe six sets, you know, attacking the Catalans, and they were just literally clueless. So I think there's big problems there um, for St. Helens on the courts, Kane and Cunningham. I know he came out and blasted his senior players, and fair enough, you know, they they were laying him down. That, but that's, that's an interesting point, though. He, he pointed the finger at the senior players. Yeah. Who were they? I mean, he's not going to drop John Wilkin. He's yeah. not going to drop James Rowe. And he will drop Walsh because he's, he's, so a, he's a linchpin. He's aimed at the senior players. Who? Well, you know, they're, Alex they're Warnsley isn't ones. having the same impact yet this year than he did last year. But he's still one of their best players. He's still one of, still their, one best of their best players. players. Uh, so, you know, interesting who that comment's aimed at. And again, um, like Hulk KR in many respects, he can't change anything. Fa fabulous news that um, Johnny Lomax has started mm. his comeback after 13 months with a reserve grade game, but he can't make wholesale changes. So again, you can come out and say, I blame X, but X has still got to play next week. I'll tell you what, he keeps threatening to do it, that he's going to drop players, and he said this week he's going to drop players, so it will be interesting, but uh, and I say the uh, the main one for me is Luke Walsh doesn't seem comfortable in that St. I think again, jo moment. Jordan Turner's the enigma for me, yeah, because yeah. I, I don't think they've decided where his best, where position, his best position, is. position is. You know, they played him a bit of loose forward, then they move him to stand off, then they stick him in the centres and he has the talent, there's no question about that, but it's almost like keep trying to find a place for him is almost summing up the inconsistency of St Helens at the moment. They are back in action on Friday against Leeds, who are back to winning ways on uh, Friday. Leeds obviously traditionally uh, very good at uh, picking up wins when it's very wet underfoot. And a narrow victory over Hull FC. Is this the turning point? I listened to Brian McDermott's press conference. He was I, all happy and smiling. Well, he was keen to say that just because you've won it isn't necessarily a turning point. I think he's right. But we were saying over the last couple of weeks, when and how is it going to turn? And I, I think the conventional wisdom was they need to just jag a win from somewhere. Um, and they did. I thought they were very disciplined. They defended extremely well in torrential conditions. Two of the three tries that they conceded were from kicks, which hard enough to, to cover on, on, a, on a good track, but difficult when it's greasy. Um, we said they needed a leader. They've got Jamie Jones Buchanan back. I thought he was absolutely outstanding. Uh, Jordan Lilly had a very good first half and scored an excellent try in the second. Um, so I, th I think the, the small ingredient to their Carl Ablett being back really helps. Um, so yeah, I, they need to build something, but one, one win doesn't make a summer. Mm. Yeah, <coughs> win's a win, I guess, to, uh, to be honest with you, Phil, from there. But uh, it's that confidence what they wanted. I, uh, I think said the week before, when's Lee's season going to start? And I was hoping it was going to start against Salford the week before. But hopefully now, this is when Lee's season going to start. And, and to be honest, they've got a away game this weekend. And if it was looking at the league table, they'd think, well, where would you like to go if we're going to keep this confidence going? And it would be St. Helens. You know, a Leeds. team that last year couldn't be. <coughs> absolutely. You know, so Leeds would be delighted, uh, I say with that win, you mentioned Jamie Jones, Pugh Cannon, absolutely outstanding. Lily, again, you know, I've been saying now he should hopefully keep that Leeds jersey rather than being sent out. It's interesting uh, what Brian McDermott said about him, though, in the second half, saying that he didn't think that he did enough, didn't have his hands on the ball enough, didn't take his pressure off the forwards enough, he was waiting for the big play. So, again, I think... You know, we shouldn't expect too much of him. He's still only 19 and barely touched 10 first-team games. Yeah, but I thought Ashton Golding gave them yeah, a, a he, different he, dimension. Yeah, he was. He was OK. But at the end of the day, we're talking about confidence here, Phil. We just yeah. can't say to Jordan Lilly, we'll leave you out and say, no, 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 no. To bring no, you back. But, you don't, we but can't I don't keep think doing we can that, expect though. him at his age to I fully, every week be the Messiah. I, I, I agree with that totally. But at the end of the day, you know, it's no good for him whatsoever no. by going somewhere that he doesn't want I, to be. I also think Rob Burrow was outstanding. outstanding. Yeah, um, Burrow, and outstanding. the fact that he's played the full 80 minutes and Falloon didn't come off the bench mm. said how well he was playing and again people like Rob Burrow, Danny Maguire if he's back this week need to take a little bit of the pressure off Jordan Lilly and allow him to play. But to, en Encouraging. Mm. Whereas Hull on the other hand I thought were a lot of size, throw a lot at you in terms of the physical side of the game but one dimensional when it came to pace and I know Jamie Shaw was a late withdrawal but if they had a couple mm. of really quick players to work on the kind of things that Frank Pritchard was doing and Sikamanu can do, and yeah. obviously they've got Gareth Ellis to come back as well, um, I'm just slightly disappointed that they didn't produce a little bit more on, a, on attack. But again, we, we Hull, it's a situation where, yeah, well, mm, Hull are doing well now, and when you're expecting to win, they come up with a pretty poor performance, don't they? So, you know, can Hull you know, go all the way, and it, again, it's that consistency of getting, you know, hitting, hitting the straps at the right time, consistency, but... 
No. Hmm. And they've it's got some big players to come back. Minicello's big for them as well. And yeah. I think, uh, again, if Shaw's there, um, it allows them to move well, their back if, division if, around. If Shaw had been bit. there on Friday night, he would have scored two times. Well, and Curtis pitch, Norton yeah. on the wing would have given them more pace yeah, as well, so. rather anyway. than isolate him at full back. But I, I think they probably do need to hit back. The, what was it, five matches they went unbeaten? Uh, that derails them just only slightly, but they need to show to their fans that they can do it. But Wolfie, for sure, it won't be easy this week because they go into the fall team and Rich's team and Wakefield at the weekend. Well, this is a game I've already predicted, draw permitting, this is what we're going to see at Wembley. Wakefield versus Hull will be the uh, 2016 Challenge Cup final, a repeat of the 1970. Rich, Rich, Richie, Richie, I call Mark Wilson bonkers. <laughs> Richie, sure, oh. right, I'm calling you oh. bonkers now. Is it just every, just every chance it could happen? Until they get drawn together. Yeah, on, absolutely. On you just and then, you know, it's all gone yeah, wrong, yeah. but you know, apart from that. <laughs> um, so, uh, Hull obviously travelling to Wakefield. Um, Huddersfield, we, we said, when are Huddersfield and Leeds going to win again? And people said, well, perhaps when they meet in a couple of weeks, and we said that might be a draw. But now Huddersfield have won their second game of the season, still bottom of the table, but an impressive 11 0 win. There's a scoreline you don't hear very often over to Warrington Wolves. And I guess before we get to uh, Huddersfield, um, Warrington. Mm. What, Lost what, three what's out going of four. On? Well, Gary predicted to win the treble, and they're not won since. <laughs> That's as simple as that. A bit harsh, Phil. A bit harsh, Phil. <laughs> but Tony um, and Smith were very clear. Okay, the conditions, but it's still the same for both teams. Mm. And Tony were quite simple, saying, "Well, we need to score up a point because our attack was rubbish." You know, and uh, yeah. I like Tony's open and honesty at times. He doesn't. He doesn't mince his words. And when he, you know, when his team needs the applause and he gives it, but when, you know, they don't come up with a performance as they should do against the Huddersfield team, lacking confidence, but. Uh, We'll be for sure. Um, I'm hoping, very much hoping. It looks like that, the way Danny Brook played on Friday night, that uh, himself and, and, and Paul have sorted out the little bit of differences, yeah, yeah. sorted that out, and Bruffy was back to his best, you know, getting the team around the park. Uh, his kicking game was very much varied, kept Warrington under the cosh, and 11 0 against the Champions yeah. yeah, and 11 0 against, uh, you know, a Warrington team that have been going excellent. This year. Even though Sandal's missing, when you look at that team, what played on Friday night, yeah. still plenty of strike plays out there. Gidley, who's been excellent all season, I think uh, Anderson would be delighted from that. And looking at that performance from there, the confidence what he will get, I don't think it will be a bottom four save this year. I think the two big things is the nil in the yeah. in the Colin Fieldersfield. That would be massive for Paul Anderson. Um, I think he prides himself and always has done on the fact that he's got a very resilient team. So to, to not only beat the league leaders, but to nil the league leaders, that would be really big for Huddersfield. But the other thing as well is every team will have a dip in the season. And this just might be Warrington's little wobble. Uh, it comes again on the back of the Easter period where your resources are going to be at their most stretched. And um, I wouldn't read too much into the fact that they've lost three out of four. That might just be the galvanising that they need in the middle of the season to carry on with the job, to start looking at what went wrong last year and say, we're not going to let this happen again. So I guess Huddersfield and Leeds as dips came at the start of the season, now they're going to go up and... Uh, well, that's you never know what's going to happen. And I was at the game on, on Friday and obviously uh, Tony Smith knows more than I do and I can't disagree with his assessment that uh, Whiter's attack wasn't very good because I think bar a couple of line breaks, they didn't really look like getting through and getting past that Huddersfield defence and defence without Earl Crabtree and, and Lan Patrick. And Patrick again, I think the, the encouraging sign for Tony Smith would be that even though his side gave away an awful lot of ball, they did only concede 11 points, mm. which, uh, you know, I, I think he'd be quite pleased with, with that overall effort that his team put. One mark of Danny Bruff's uh, performance, six goal line dropouts forced in the first half mm. uh, from uh, Huddersfield. Which well, was just tells you, Bruffy, because uh, a week before... Um, you know, it's, uh, to well, a couple of weeks, uh, Casper, you know, the, the poorest game I've ever seen him play. But as I said, we, we bruffy from a point of view. He he looks at his consistency in his play as an individual because if he's on form, then Huddersfield, you know, rarely lose a game, do they? But, uh, Kyle Wood back as well to yeah. partner him, which again. But he's looking for about eight, eight nine out of ten performance. And I, I would imagine what the reports would have heard from Bruffy on Friday night. It certainly was up there, eight, eight uh, nine and, out and of ten. And Ryan Hinchcliffe played with this located finger, so. Uh, Huddersfield travelled to Wigan on uh, Thursday night. Wigan, who uh, came through against uh, Castleford on uh, Friday. Listen to uh, Matt Wilson's commentary. I think there was a few uh, uh, naughty tackles from uh, some Wigan players in this one. Certainly a late hit on uh, Luke Gale. I guess we'll wait to see if the disciplinary make anything of that or anything in the match. But uh, Wigan, level on points now. Whiting, Catalans and Wigan, all with eight wins from 11. Mm. And that'll be, uh, I guess... Again, another just getting over the line kind of win. Well, I would imagine the happiest coach in Super League so far will be Sean Wayne because mm. his team aren't playing anywhere near what they can do. Certainly on attack, you know, the, again, 
that's not striking there. They're pretty clueless. You know, we know McAllen is out, we know Lachlan's out, and also two uh, Williams hasn't been there. But still, you know, um, the winning ugly. Sean knows that. But as I say, he will be the happiest coach so far in Super League in the position what they're in, and as I say the way that they're playing. I think all he needed to do was turn around the 62 0 defeat of the week before, and uh, and to do that, I think he'd be absolutely delighted. He was he. he kept mentioning without saying I want to mention it, a virus that was running through the camp. Um, there seems to be a lot of illness around Super League teams at the moment. Cast conversely, it just seems to have got, uh, again, this injury run. As a, it's always going to catch up with you at, at one game or another and it's, it seems that Darrell Powell thought that he just ran out of resources for that game. Um, they do need to, to, to put a run together soon, Castleford, if, they, if they're going to achieve their top four ambitions. I think that's gone, Phil, don't you? Cast out top four, are they? I'm not sure. I, I think the season we're having at the moment, I wouldn't be confident to predict from one week to the next. But two weeks ago, we were saying, well, aren't Saints great? They've just beaten Warrington. And now we're saying, you now struggling in mid table. So I, I don't think you can read too much of a form line into it, other than that we're going to be extremely difficult to beat. And Catalan could mm. be the surprise package this year. Yes. But uh, I wouldn't rule Cass out just yet. Sort of Strange division there so far. Let's hear from the Castle Recursion. and Darrell Powell spoke to in the last tackle after that defeat at Wigan and what he made of the game. Um, you know, I, I thought the try um, when Willie Iser goes and stands in the line, you know, when they were two points up, was should have been chalked off. Would have been on if it was on TV, but yeah, it was tight all the way through. We we just we lacked a little bit of, we lacked a little bit of quality in our play tonight and I thought we defended awesome, you know, they they came with a game in the second half that put us under a lot of pressure, made minimal errors, kicked really well. And we just couldn't quite find a spark to get us out of um, of yardage and into into good field position. So, you know, I think that they they deserve to win the game. They had, they had a lot more ball than us in, in decent field position and we had to work really hard to, to keep them out and that, that drained our energy reserves a little bit. So yeah, it's disappointing now I think yeah, you know, obviously we we um, we're lacking a, we lacked a little bit of fluency tonight with the ball. We couldn't quite uh, break them down, and you know they worked hard on on the back of what happened to them last week. They um, they'll, they'll be pleased that they've battled to that. Uh, both both sides have got a few troops missing, and sometimes yeah. it, it does you know it, it, it sort of um, puts a damper on the on the quality at times. But it was a tough game, and, and I thought our boys were really tough. Thought we defended great tonight. What happened with the first try when McGill was singing? Was he was there some dispute about that? I I think he thought that it was a, a forward pass. You know, there's a backhand pass um, where he threw it out the back. Looked like he might have travelled forward. Yeah. Um, I think he he was a little bit disappointed with that. And, uh, yeah, I don't know what he said to be honest, but yeah. I think that was what he what he was yeah. uh, talking to him about. And Jake Webster, what was wrong with him? His ankle, is it? Or? No, his, his hip, he was he was struggling rolling into the game. Yeah, we had a couple of guys out there who um, who were struggling. He was one of them and, and we had to we had to take him off. That impacted on us again really. Just our our centre options were um were, were pretty limited. We we put uh, Ollie Holmes out there. Um, we're having to adjust all of a lot at the moment which which makes it tough, but you know, we were in that game for most of it. Um, so it's this point the last first but you know we just got to learn a couple of lessons there's, there's a few things in there that I think we can we can learn and, and look to improve uh, on um, ultimately it's it's one game and uh, you know we just need to move on now okay our next up make sure we get that job done and be an important game for us Casper coach Darrell Powell there uh, they've got uh, Hawkins the Rovers this week at home in Super League which were now 11 rounds in everyone's played 11 games we're almost at the one well, the halfway point before the split. White and top, Huddersfield bottom. Where are we going to be in 12 rounds time? Honestly, I haven't <laughs> got a clue. I have no idea. Right, that's the end of the programme. No, <laughs> well, no, how could, how could anybody with it's any great, degree of certainty say how they think the, the season... Interestingly enough, 2007, I think it was, Huddersfield lost their first seven games when John Sharp was in charge. Um, that was the last time they had a start as poor as this, they ended up fifth, uh, made the playoffs, so uh, I don't know if Leeds and Huddersfield can hit a run, run of form, who would then drop into the, the, the bottom four? You'd, you'd say Salford might worry, Widners have, have lost a little bit of form but gained some confidence with a big Challenge Cup win. Um, 
Whole car obviously now are looking favourites perhaps to finish bottom unless there is this great soul searching exercise that goes on that provides the answer. Uh, but I, I don't think we can get Salford may well lose points. Uh, I think next week they've got their, uh, their inquiry at, the, at Red Hall. Um, if you were the Super League general manager, now wouldn't be a time to believe in your post, would well, it? <laughs> no, exactly. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. I mean, could we see a surprise name in that bottom four? Obviously, before the season, you would have thought Wakefield, Hulkingston Rovers, Witness, and A N other as last year. Mm. And at the moment, Wakefield and Hulk are in there, but uh, Wakefield obviously much improved from last year. Leeds and Huddersfield are in there, but we don't think they'll finish mm. in the bottom four. But could we see one of the bigger names? Could I, I don't want to say St Helens, but could we see they're saying a, a St Helens or a Leeds or a Huddersfield in that mm. bottom four this year? And, and great for the competition if we do. <coughs> I don't think we will, to be honest with you. I don't think because. Uh, as you saw this weekend, Huddersfield, you know, they, they could quite easily now go on a four or five game, you know, when you're, so, so can Leeds, St. Helens could maybe go on a two or three, so, but I, I think that you, the top four after round 23 will be Wigan, Warrington, uh, Catalans and Hull, that's how I think the top four, whichever position, uh, I wouldn't like to say I'll finish the top, <laughs> at, the, at the moment, I, I would say Warrington do the table, but the moment you look at the consistency, you, you, you put Catalans up there, but I think that would be, that, that would be my top four, after round 23, and the, and the bottom four, I mean the bottom four, so Ulkinson Rovers, they're the worst team in Super League for me, but Ulkinson Rovers, I think Wayfield have been there, Salford have been there, and I think Wigness will get dragged in there. And Leeds and Huddersfield, they'll go on them runs, get themselves in the top eight, and uh, who knows from that seven games. But I think, I think probably all we can say at the moment is it looks as though if they can maintain their form, that Catalan could well be the team in the top four that perhaps hadn't been predicted mm. by too many before the season. So as we uh, head into the uh, midway points before the split, and then there's another bit of the season uh, to come, the, the news last week brought that uh, Blake Solly, Super League's general manager, is, uh, he's off. He's uh, uh, signed up for the Sydney, uh, South Sydney Rabbitohs. Uh, surprisingly moving from Super League and not called Burgess to uh, head to that club and work for Russell Crowe and et cetera, et cetera. Um, what, what's going to happen? If, if we put you in charge... And why wouldn't Super you? League. And why wouldn't well, we, we could, you could both do it as a, well, a partner. Split the money. <laughs> yes, half a week each. <laughs> <laughs> you can do Mondays and Tuesdays. Yeah. I think there'd be a huge uproar if I was made the cheapest. <laughs> uh, uh, Might shake uh, up a uh, bit. Of the RFL, though. I'd shake it up. Don't worry about that, of <laughs> the RFL. But obviously, you know, with Blake going, because he seems to be doing a good job. He, uh, you know, he seems to have the backing of all the Super League uh, chairmen and chief executives. So, you know, there's been a fallout. It seems to be, uh, you know, with Nigel Wood himself and, and Blake there from there. and. I guess he's seen the opportunity of going back home and uh, you know to the South City take on that big responsibility there. But I guess the question is going to be who's going to replace him and, uh, and who then who's going to be in control? Kevin Sinfield. Well, he's at Rugby Union, isn't he? You know, so, uh, no, I, I use him as an what example. What about Gary Everton? What about Gary? Can, can, can I, I he not think do the two jobs? This, this, this can he not a, be in charge of Leeds no. and, and be in charge of Super I, th I think this is a role where the 12 club chief executive stroke owners dictate the policy mm. and the general manager implements it. For me, this would be an absolutely ideal job for a player who has just retired. So we get that input from somebody who's been on the field and somebody who's got perhaps um, some kind of a business or a, an administrative degree, which is why I mentioned Kevin Sinfield. Um, not because necessarily he would want, even want to do it, but I think we've seen Jamie Peacock with that qualification at Hull KR. I think we've got people like John Wilkin, who is admittedly still playing. We've got Luke Robinson, who's just uh, been forced into early retirement. I just think this is a post now that, that maybe with the guidance of those 12 chairmen as to what they want the sport to look like, we could do with a player's input. And we listened to Luke Robinson speak a lot of sense last week. Yeah, he was, he absolutely. was in your chair last week speaking a lot of sense. It's, uh, oh, what are you trying to say? I was going to say it was refreshing, but that would that What are you trying to say? <laughs> As we head into the weekend then, some big fixtures, Wigan Huddersfield on Thursday, Friday at St Helens, Leeds, Witness and Warrington, the, all these meetings which seem to have been from a couple of weeks ago coming back round again, Catalan Salford on Saturday and then on Sunday in Super League, it's Castleford Hull KR, Wakefield versus Hull FC. Can I mention something about the fixtures? Who on earth that drew up the fixtures thought it would be a good idea to have Wakefield and Castleford at home at the same time against the two teams from Hull? Nonsense. So I just thought I'd say. Like your aunts, Phil. Like your aunts. Mm. Good point, actually. Good point. I mean, I hope the M62 curbs. I'm sure yeah, good point. But, uh, but it's, it's ludicrous, isn't it? There must be some 
technical reason why I don't, I don't know. Make up the I blame English. the Canadian fixture for the Canadians. Well, maybe now that the uh, the, the chairman of Wigan is also the chairman of the uh, the English Football League as it's uh, been rebranded, he'll be able to stop this nonsense of uh, you know football clubs having to play be af before, after, whenever it's uh, rugby clubs. Well, don't worry. Friday we get the Four Nations fixtures and venues. Steady on. Are we going to Anfield? We know it. We'll find out. We'll know on Friday. Have you bought your tickets? What, what game are you most looking forward to then this weekend? Wakefield Hull, me. They are. Wakefield, the, the, the form team. And uh, to keep playing like they do. And uh, two contrasted teams, Hull, big. You know, the form, they, they will have to try and bash him down the middle and just play around the rook area from there. And if Wakefield can more than match him, and they say the way they've been playing with that bit of uh, vision and awareness and letting the ball do the work. I think Wayfield could top of the black and whites at the weekend. I think uh, Wigan Huddersfield looks an intriguing game. That uh, They've had some some, in, some good battles over the last few years. Um, Huddersfield, this will be the test of whether it is a, a revival or not. And, and I think Wigan will get more thrown at them than they normally do. So, uh, yeah, that would be an interesting game. I'm looking forward to that. Wigan, although Wigan, I think, beat Huddersfield all four times they played last year. So they would start as favourites. They will start as favourites, but I think it's, we saw in Super League last weekend four teams started as favourites, and only Wigan were the ones to win. Even even Hull were favourites on Friday night against Leeds uh, eventually, but uh, Leeds obviously came through. We'll see if they do against St Helens on Friday, and I'm sure next week we'll be predicting somebody else to win Super League because no doubt Catalans will have lost to Salford, uh, Widnes will have beat Warrington, and Huddersfield will have beaten Wigan, and we'll be, vive, all be back. Vive, in the same vive la France! Vive la France! Vive la différence! Uh, we we bid you adieu here on the last deck. We're getting in touch uh, throughout the week at RL on our way the place to do so. And as we uh, go, we will scrum down now with uh, the injured uh, Warrington forward, Mitchell Dodds. Mitchell Dodds, uh, and I'm a front row. <laughs> Night out. Uh, bitter. Tenerife. <laughs> <laughs> Favourite away ground. Um, uh, Olympic Stadium. Olympic Stadium. <laughs> 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 Big Brother, I don't know. It's a terrible question. <laughs> Uh, chocolate. I can't say that. Kurt Gidley, best trainer. Um, uh, Westy. Um, Alan Langer. <laughs> <laughs> 